Ha! <sighs> you know, Mets fans, this whole winning thing has been a lot of fun. And that held true again tonight for the Amazons as they would kick off a three-game set against the Cincinnati Reds facing their former first-round draft pick back in 2016 in Justin Dunn. And what happens, they end up winning 5-1 is your final against Cincinnati. This was a little bit of a snooze fest at times. The Reds did their best Mets impressions with all this soft contact, but no less, the better team in the end would hold true with the victory as the Amazons come out and now are at 71-39 and on the season, folks. They have won 13 of their past 15 games. And all I got to ask for everyone here in the live show as we speak let's spam those w's you know what to do right now folks let's get those w's in the chat right now we got a lot of deep dive on this mets victory 5-1 and seabass was truly the story of the game and the mets big boppers that they acquired by the deadline continue to hold true continue to take advantage of their opportunities in this mets lineup so much positives to take away from tonight's victory guys i'm not gonna be screaming my head off like I was in the Braves series because it's the Red Series. I expect this Mets team to win. And now they're already one game away. Will Cookie Carrasco on the bump and which I'll be in attendance at tomorrow. They win tomorrow. They win this series. So hopefully that does in fact happen, guys. How's it going, everybody? Thank you all so much for chiming in for the latest post-game show here on the channel. I'll be deep diving everything that you guys need to know. Sharing my raw reactions, as always, to another day. Another Mets victory. 5-1 was your final got plenty to get into but again continue smashing that like and subscribe button as your first chime in folks greatly appreciate it. i'm very happy about this mets club right now i mean how can you not be they just continue to lay out victories they're beating teams they're supposed to beat and again they're already one win away from securing securing the series dub they have been simply dominant post all-star break they had a great first half but they continued that to new heights now with their new acquisitions being heavy parts in this offensive success the pitching stays stellar the mets were rotation has quite literally been the best in baseball since Mad Max's return a month ago if not even earlier than that they have been cruising Seabass what a story he was tonight Tyler Naquin how are you doing the former uh the former Cincinnati Red now foe for the Reds as he is a New York Met he balled out in the eighth one needed to add some insult to injury adding that icy on the cake the cherry on top if you will to secure this Mets dub. Adam Adovino will get into as well. Didn't have the prettiest ninth, but still secured things without a problem. This was a nice win for the Amazons, and we got playing to get into, guys. So, again, thank you all so much to everyone for chiming in. Greatly appreciate you all. McBlam with the $5 dono. Let's get it, McBlam, real quick. Thank you so much for that, brother. McBlam says, let's see your nice dub, but Dana, how many home runs are you going to be uh, are going to be stolen from us? I know. And, of course, the one man that steals a stole, uh, home run from us is what we see right here in the highlights in the show. That's former Met, now foe, and Albert Amora Jr., who, again, he's always been known for good defense. Had a couple nice plays running into the wall otherwise for the Mets in the 2021 season. He would rob Frankie Lindor of a potential massive bomb. But before we get into that, guys, I just want to thank you all once more for first chiming in. We got upwards of five, 400 viewers right here in the live show after a win against the Cincinnati Reds. That's how I know that you Mets fans are feeling electric. You're feeling great. I know I am. Every single win down the stretch for the Mets means something for this team as they continue to gain ground on the Braves, on the Phillies. Braves had an off day, so now the Mets are officially seven games up. At the time of recording this, at the time of being live here in the NL least, they now have more wins, if I'm not mistaken, than the New York Yankees. So not that it means too much, but yes, the Mets have the second most wins in all of baseball. The only club they're trailing by, I believe it's four. Correct me if I'm wrong. Of course, I can be wrong. I'm usually wrong a couple times here in these shows. Is yes, the Los Angeles Dodgers. But man, oh man, nice win. Feeling very nice. Seven game lead gives me PTSD, says Sarah. That's my Dave with the dono. Thank you so much for the $5 donation, Dave. Greatly appreciate you. But guys, let's talk about the Mets. Let's talk about this nice win for them tonight, shall we? We're, again, I'm not going to be jumping. I'm not going to be going as crazy and berserk as I have been in previous shows. Again, the Braves series, that was so important. It meant so much to this Mets club to win four or five against the Atlanta Braves to really secure themselves and solidify that, yes, we are the top dog, and if you're going to go through the NL East, you have to go through the Mets first and foremost, and they continue their winning ways tonight against these Cincinnati Reds, everybody. So as always, thank you so much for chiming in. 
Guys, help us get to 100 likes for the first short-term goal here in the chat to my roughly 400 live viewers. For people on replay, thank you so much. You can help us get an 18K sub to the next short-term goal on the channel, guys. We have been thriving. The channel has been doing a phenomenal job. It's all because of each and every one of you amazing Mets viewers, whether you're watching live on replay, however you're watching, know that I greatly appreciate you. But enough of me rambling for the first five or so minutes here in the live show, guys. Let's talk about this Mets win because this was a little bit of a berserk one. I got to tip my cap and give credit where credit's due. The Cincinnati Reds came out tonight, and what did they do? They came out with, in part, not fully, but in part, a New York Mets game plan. They went with soft contact, and it led to a lot of runners on base. However, this is the difference between the Cincinnati Reds team that has no Tyler Naquin, that has no Brandon Drury, that has no Tommy Pham, that has no Luis Castillo, and that has no Tyler Maley. This is a depleted club that you know is not more than likely not going to be thriving with runners in scoring position. Very 2021 Mets-esque of them, but not 2022 Mets. As the Mets, even while they left some guys on base today, were able to get those big hits when it mattered most. And start off in the first thing, guys. You know the drill by now. I'm going to repeat myself as much as I possibly can. But for everyone, you know the story by now, guys. What do I always say? Let me hear it in the chat. I feel like I almost don't need to repeat myself at this juncture. But when the Mets score in the first, the second, or the third inning, what happens? They tend to score often. and They tend to win ball games, folks. Brandon Nimmo does what he does best. So that's why getting on base, it was a hit by pitch against Justin Dunn. Dunn entering today's game, what has been his biggest gripe so far as a starter in parts of three seasons with the uh, Seattle Mariners when the Mets trade him in the Edwin Diaz deal, that actually looking like the Mets did in fact win that deal at this point in time, which is not to say, but when Edwin is a borderline Cy Young candidate right now this year, doing things that really recently have never done in their careers, you know the Mets are winning that deal at the moment. But on top of that, you see Justin Dunn, he struggled. He's hit a lot of batters in his young career as a starter. He's walked a lot of guys. He's given up plenty of stolen bags. And the Mets took full advantage of the erraticness that can be Justin Dunn. The hit by pitch of Brandon Nemo hit his foot. I think it was on a curveball or just an off-speed pitch. Brandon Lux with the $5 dono. Thank you so much for that one, Brandon. Brandon says, I'm super happy with Bass's performance and how this team has been playing. But we can get, uh, but can we please get one complete game? They played 110 games, no complete game. Brandon, complete games are fun. Don't get me wrong. But you know what's even more important? Making sure that you do not risk your starters of injury. Chris Bassett threw 114 pitches today, folks. It's not easy to get a complete game, and there's no need to. Let's keep it out of that. There's no need for the Mets to try to push a complete game. If it's going to happen, I'd rather come with, say, if a guy is going very minimal with his pitch count through nine. Bassett was doing that early, but then again, a lot of fluky hits, some bad defensive plays, miscues by the Mets, and that led his pitch count to get up. But if we're going to see a complete game, it's going to probably come from a dominant game where the Mets know they need a win and say a rivalry matchup against the Braves or potentially a Dodgers, the Yankees. When those games really matter and mean most, you know, maybe we'll see tomorrow a cookie on the bump. Maybe we'll see it with Ty on Wednesday. But all I know is that complete games for me, as, a, as entertaining as they are, they aren't nearly as important, in my opinion, as just making sure that you keep your starting staff healthy. That's what you need. The Mets are almost a short lock and not getting wood for the postseason. It's just a matter of how far will they go. And they will surely go as far as the starting staff will take them. So the biggest takeaway, you got to make sure that these guys stay healthy first and foremost. But regardless, Brandon, I understand 100% what you're saying. Thank you so much for the donut, my friend. But we saw Brandon Nemo rather, getting himself a, a hit by pitch. And then Starling Marte makes no mistake. Marte has been absolutely red hot this season. He's batting right around 300 with over 800 OPS. Gets a no doubt two run shot to give the Mets their early lead up to nothing in the first. I already knew. I feel I felt confident that the Mets were going to win this ball game, but it would continue. They would continue to roll. They would continue to thrive. And as you would see here, guys, in the second, the Mets would try to tack on more. Could not do that, however. But Jeff McNeil will enter today's game with a 10 game hitting streak. Made that number 11 with a nice base knock. James McCann had a base knock too. Shout out to James. Shout out to the Mets hitters as the Mets have been thriving, guys, in the second half. One, uh, one of my biggest takeaways has been how impressed I have been with the Mets and their catchers. The fact that we're at minimum getting at least one hit from these guys on almost an every night basis might not seem like much for a Mets, but for a Mets team that's as deep as it is, one through eight, and that has had little to no offensive production the entire year from the catching position, it's important to get these base knocks. So I appreciate that from James. Thank you so much for that one. Mets win score in the second, however. But as we got to the third, guys, as Chris Bassett is dealing through 30 pitches, through three, had a no-hitter going through three-plus. Jeff McGill, however, made a phenomenal defensive play, almost made it twice today. 
botched it a little bit, only got the force out the second time in the fourth. But in the third, guys, McNeil with some great awareness that you see here in the highlights at some point. If you haven't watched it right, you will soon hear in the show. You saw McNeil allow the ball to drop in between between first and second. That way, instead of getting the pop out and only getting one out potentially, he was able to get the runner out at second and at first with a clutch double play to end the inning in the third. In the bottom of the third, you see Francisco Lindor would get walked. He would eventually steal second base. Lindor did not have a great day at the plate. He did have a run scored, which is always nice. But he got that run scored because of the man that we love so much, the man that I'm always raving about, and that is Hoagie Vogie, Daniel Vogelback himself, with a beautiful two-out base knock, rips it to right, avoids the shift, gets it past the infielder that's playing deep on him, and shallow right there. And Vogie ripped what was a pitch up high and out of the zone too. So I appreciate that from Vogelback. He's continued to rake his seventh RBI, if I'm not mistaken, for the Mets so far this year. He's batting over 300, has over 1,000 OPS for the Amazons. How can you not love Daniel Vogelback? This guy's just been nothing short of an absolute stud, and he's not the only one. All the Mets' offensive acquisitions have stepped up to the plate in more ways than I could begin to tell you right now. If you've been watching every game with Vogelback, with Ruff, with Naquin, you know how pivotal these guys have been to helping depth in the Mets lineup, both offensively and defensively. And overall, just give them a better shot to win on an everyday basis. But I see JV with the $5 donut. Thank you so much, Ben. Tenny who? Yeah, Benny, he's doing all right for the Yanks, but nothing that us Mets fans should be scoffing about. The Mets have a phenomenal job with their offensive acquisitions thus far. Uh, Dunn wasn't terrible, but Na uh, Bet Naquin was pumped. Oh, I'm sure he was, absolutely. Thank you so much, 1200 1200 this has to be the first dono in existence that you don't mention one of Trevor Mayer Zapucky's name. I guess times truly are changing right for our friends here in the team of Queens. But thank you so much for that dono. I appreciate it. Yeah, Justin Dunn wasn't terrible at all tonight. He settled in a little bit. Look, he gave up three earned over 4.2. Not the end of the world. It was his first start at the MLB level in over a year's span. Last time he was on the bump was with the Seattle Mariners. This year, he was pitching in AAA for the Cincinnati Reds. Of course, if you guys don't remember, Dunn was acquired by the Reds this past offseason when the trade that ended up being, uh, pardon me, I, I don't know why it's Sonny Gray. That was the Minnesota Twins deal. But rather, it was Jesse Winker and Eugenio Suarez that got sent to Seattle. And what was a big blockbuster deal at the time this past offseason, Justin Dunn was one of the young pitchers heading the other way. He's already been traded twice in his early young career. I like Justin Dunn, though. I wish him nothing but the best. And the Mets got on to him. They got enough. And Mets scored 5 plus in 10 straight. Yes, they have, Kevin. I, I, I was going to get to that, but you beat me to it. Appreciate the donation a lot. That's okay. Hype in the chat here to Nash here with a perfect comment as well. The Mets, 10 straight games now with a minimum of five or more runs scored. We take that to the bank. Talk about consistency. The Mets have gotten it from the rotation, but they surely have gotten it from their offense too, which isn't just a breath of fresh air for this club, a team that is so Jekyll and Hyde from what they were in 2021, but is proving that time in and time out, you expect the Mets to score a good amount of runs, regardless of if they're facing the depleted Cincinnati Reds or they're facing the top dogs and say the Atlanta Braves, the LA Dodgers, the New York Yankees. The Mets are just getting the job done every single day, but thank you so much for the dono. I really do appreciate that. Hype in the chat to you, my friend. And you're right, guys. My mistake, again, guys, I always have one error here on the graphic. I'm glad that you guys mentioned it. I always have one error. I meant to put one run, not one earn run. You're correct. Chris Bassett went eight shutty today, had one run score that it wasn't his fault. That was because of an error. But other than that, he was absolutely stellar. And I have a lot to say on Seabass. We'll deep dive that here shortly, guys. But we see here Lindor, Vogie getting the job done. And you see Lindor now has 11 straight games for the Mets with at least one run scored. So even though he didn't have it with the bat today, he got on base and he made things happen. You love to see that, guys. But I'm glad that you brought up Seabass. Yes, you are 1,000% right. It was not an earned run. It was just a run overall. Again, I, I somehow always manage to mess up one statistic on my graphics, and I just wait for you guys to call me out and tell me when I'm wrong. No problem. I'm glad you guys did. And that makes me even happier, if I'm not going to lie, because that means that Seabass now is a 3.39 area on the year, baby. We take that to the bank. But we look at the Mets. They got damage done there in the first and then the third. We get to the fourth. Joey Votto brings in a run on a fielder's choice, and that was unfortunate because that ending, if I'm not mistaken, start with Pete Alonso not being able to handle things at first. It shouldn't have been a guy at first. It was. Ends up being a guy coming in to score Joey Votto just on the fielder's choice. That would be the only run that would score today for Cincinnati. They had plenty of opportunities. There was so much soft contact. 
They even had some challenges that went their way as well. However, what was interesting was after that fourth concluded and the Reds got their first run of the day, Mike Moustakis, who did not look comfortable after what should have easily been a two-bagger that he was only able to get a single in that, in that top, top of the fourth, he looks like he hurt his foot a little bit. He's been dealing with foot injuries this past year. That held true. He would exit the game after the fourth, and so did, surprisingly, and Jonathan India, the 2021 NL Rookie of the Year. If you guys don't know, India, who ranked against the Mets, especially in City Field last year, let's not forget. India grew up a New York native, a diehard New York Mets fan. I love the kid. Anytime the Mets play him, I wish him the best, as long as the Mets still win in the end. Unfortunately, that India exited the game. He looked a little hurt. He hustled down the line and got there safe because Alonzo couldn't handle it with the glove, however. But India looks like he tweaked something, and that would keep him out for the remainder of the game. That would still benefit the Mets down the stretch here. But we get to the fifth inning again. You see Chris Bass getting himself in some jams, some unfortunate jams, a lot of soft contact. I cannot emphasize that enough. I guess this is what Braves fans feel like being frustrated for five games straight where the Mets are getting either hard exit velo, home runs, and nice gappers, or they're getting soft exit velo, lugging down to first. The Reds did the best Mets impression tonight, and I give them all the credit in the world for their attempts here, but it wouldn't hold true enough because you see Barrero gets on with a single. Papirski would get a walk. However, Seabass himself would turn a double playoff of a comebacker beautifully to end the inning in the fifth, guys. Then the bomb, the fifth, rather. We get to Stanley Marte, gets a base knock, steals second base. And then, unfortunately, the Mets wouldn't score there because Francisco Lindor, as you see right here, or pardon me, in the highlights overall that we have in the show, was robbed of what would have been a dead center multi-run bomb. Lindor's been so red hot. Unfortunately, he couldn't get that. But it was a no-doubt home run. But Abra Amora Jr. with a phenomenal glove said, nope, not today. He knows the dimensions in City Field well. Going back to his time as a New York Met in the 2021 season, that season alone. And he robs Lindor of a home run. That's not, Unfortunately, the Mets could not get anything there in that inning. But it, I will say it was interesting because Marte, man, oh, man, it felt like this guy could have almost stole third base today. You saw when he was on third, there was no one covering him at third because of the ridiculous shifts the Reds had going on. And it literally felt like if he just waited long enough, he could have found himself stealing home. It didn't end up that way. Volgaback struck out in that inning or one of those innings that I know Marte was on base. But we do see a couple donations. Let me get to them here, guys, and then we'll go forward. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for the donation. You should take over for Gary Apple and Post Show. Oh, that's beyond kind of look. Gary Apple does a phenomenal job. I greatly appreciate the comment, no less. You know, we're doing a lot of amazing things here on the channel. The connections are opening up left, left and right. And I'm going to be completely blunt with you guys. It would not be outlandish if we are, in fact, on television or, or on radio somewhere within the next year, either just for the channel or for the Believe in Queens podcast. Episode 12 came out earlier today, by the way, folks. Make sure to check it out. Myself with Joe Sorallo. Anthony Recker was supposed to be with us. He had to do a late-minute cancellation. Not a problem, though. Rec, as we knew, was actually on TV last night for uh, NBC New York Sports with Bruce Beck going over everything that you need to know about the Mets winning four or five against the Braves. So while we were a little heartbroken, you know, sarcastically about record not being with us, we understood and he'll be back with us to record after the Cincinnati Reds series concludes. That podcast will probably come out early in the day on Thursday to get you set for the Philly series. But 1200 with the dono. Thank you so much. 1200 Zipucky would have no hit us. Here we go. The Zipucky comment. I knew that we were going to get it at some juncture. So thank you so much for that, brother. I appreciate it. You're probably right. Zipucky would have carved us up left and right. Who says no? But I see um, Matt here. I'm happy for you getting your following up. Thank you so much. The streams have been uh, have had a lot more viewers lately. Winning definitely uh, winning always helps. You know, I Mets, I think Mets fans are starting to realize how important this team is, how important this stretch is. I think more than anything, more Mets fans are now being swayed that, yeah, this team's legit. I need to start tuning in because if you're not tuning in about the team in Queens, that's over 30 games above 500 right now. That's on pace to get well over 100 wins on the year. If you're not on, if you're not following the club now, you're never going to, right? And I'm I'm thankful I've been covering this team not just this season, last year as well since we started the channel. And it's been a whirlwind. It's been amazing to see how much this club has come together and only a year's time now with all the offseason acquisitions and the trade deadline acquisitions they made, both not just player-wise, front office-wise, coaching staff-wise, Buck Showalter. He is the best manager in baseball right now, you could rightfully argue. But let's go forward here in the show, folks. Rebecca, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that, guys. But we saw the Mets here in the uh, in the sixth, rather. Uh, Senzel will get himself an infield single. One of two infield singles that the Reds would have in the sixth inning. Joey Votto will get a hit by pitch. Then Fraley, who had like a buck 68 average entering today's game, hasn't done much in his young career. 
Didn't do much today. However, I give him credit. Had a couple base knocks off of Chris Bassett. One was one was an infield single. However, with bases juice, two outs, Seabass gets the job done. He gets Aquino to get a broken bat pop out in the infield to end the inning. Jeff McNeil makes that nice grab, and that'll do her another inning unscathed for Seabass as he truly had a phenomenal outing for the team in Queens, everybody. We get to the seventh. Alberto Moore Jr. with a single. A catcher's interference by McCann, surprisingly, would have two guys on less than two. But again, another situation where a fly out would end it. Seabass is strong through seven without a problem, guys. And in the eighth, Braley would get himself a base knock. However, Buck Showalter's trusting Seabass to get out of it without a problem. And he would strike out Aquino for his eighth and final strikeout of the night. Seabass, folks, I have so much I need to say about Chris Bass and his arsenal that was utilized beautifully. Gave up some hits, gave up nine hits in total, but the majority was soft contact. I wasn't griping. And more than anything, Seabass's ability to get the Reds in a jam, you know, he was in a jam to get out of that jam without a problem almost every single inning. Shows you that mental toughness that myself and Joe Sorrell on our podcast have talked about. How we haven't necessarily been swayed by Seabass every single time he's out there with his mental toughness. However, today, he showed out this is easily one of, if not his best outing of the entire season against the depleted Rens to go eight shutty, eight Ks. Thank you so much, Chris Bass, and I cannot wait to break down his arsenal here shortly in the show. But in the bottom of the eighth, the Mets said, you know what, we're not done with our offense today. We're going to continue to do just that. Also, talking about continuing, thank you guys so much for my 500-plus live viewers in the show. Make sure to smash that like and subscribe on. We're trying to get 300-plus likes by the end of the live show, guys, and 18K subs for the next short-term goal. Thank you so much. It's greatly appreciated. But Daniel Vogelback, what does Vogie do? He had a base knock on the day, had an RBI base knock. He gets himself a beautiful double for the Mets in his final lap out of the day. Mark Cannon will come in and pinch hit for him. And then Tyler Naquin, folks, I said it entering tonight. I tweeted it on the Mets Twitter account when they released the lineup card that Naquin was starting. I said Naquin's going to rake. He's going to murder against the Reds this series. You just wait. And that held true. Naquin gets himself just shy of a multi-run bomb. Ends up being a beautifully placed off the wall and right field. Getting past the Kino with ease, the big body that he is. For a two RBI triple, folks, to increase the Mets lead from three to one to five to one. And as I mentioned earlier, and as I will say it again, that was the icing on the cake for the Mets. That was the cherry on top. Naquin, who has been nothing short of phenomenal for the Mets, guys. Loving everything about this guy. He's got a right around 800 OPS on the year. Has right around a 900 OPS against righties. How Buck Showalter has utilized this entire group, this rotation of platoon players has been nothing short of brilliant. And I fully expect Naquin to get more playing time in the next day or two, along with the bullpen. You know, let's see Michael Givens was warming up. I think he's going to pitch tomorrow or Wednesday for sure. That's the type of team that you want to pitch, gain some confidence against. But... Talking about pitching in the ninth inning, Adam Adivino would give up a couple guys on base, two guys in scoring position with two out. However, he gets out of that jam. No problem. Adam Adivino would a strikeout and a hit given up there in the in the uh, final inning for the Mets, guys, as they would secure the 5-1 victory. Big, big win for the Mets. Again, not a ginormous win to the lengths of what we saw against the Atlanta Braves, but every win matters. And I think to say it would have been frustrating if the Mets lost today, doesn't give it enough justice. I mean, this is a series where, by all means, the Mets not need, but they absolutely should sweep the Cincinnati Reds club, a depleted club, without their big boppers anymore, and the Drury's, and the Naquins, and the Fams, and also, and rotation-wise, without their star, and Luis Castillo, without Tyler Maley. They're all in different clubs now, folks. Time to take advantage. The Mets, maybe they could have taken a little bit more advantage of runners in scoring position, but in the end, they got the job done, and that is always what's going to be most important for this club down the stretch here as they get closer and closer to playoffs. But Chris Bassett, guys, he's my number one star. How can he not be? When you look at Seabass's arsenal tonight for the team in Queens, guys, he absolutely shoved. And Seabass, when he's right, he just makes hitters look silly. He had his five to six pitch mix looking beauty. He threw six pitches tonight, as a matter of fact. I love that from Chris Bassett. He started with the sinker. He had 42% of his arsenal tonight, was backed by that beautiful sinker, topping out at 95 miles per hour. Minimum was 91. The average was 93 miles per hour. The cutter, 18% of Seabass's arsenal tonight, folks. 92 topping out, 88 was the minimum, and 90 was the average. Curveball, 18% of as well. I love that curveball. It's so nasty. On the curveball, you see they're topping out 77 minimum. 76, I should say. Minimum was 70. Average was 72 on the velo. And then you get to the slider. My favorite pitch from Seabass, just because you can have the hard slider that really touches high and velo, or you can have the soft slider that really looks more of like a curveball with how slow it is. Slider, 
14% of his arsenal topped out at 84 miles per hour today, folks. That's high for a slider, I'm being honest. And the minimum was 73 for an average of 80 mile per hour on the slider. Four-seam fastball, 7% of his arsenal topped out at 96, minimum 93, average 94. And the changeup, he threw it just one time tonight, but it was still was effective. 83 miles per hour on that pitch for Seabass. So six pitches, no problem. Chris Bassett gets the job done. And the Mets continue to show why they are quite literally, if not the best and truly one of the best teams in baseball by securing victories no matter who their opponent is. And I expect nothing less from this club. I really don't. I fully expect the Mets to come out tonight had themselves a nice showing against a depleted Reds team, and that ended up holding true in the end, guys. J JV with another dono. Thank you so much for that one, JV. Let's see here. Cole, Nestor, Montas. <laughs> exactly. I mean, hey, it is what it is. I do believe the Yankees are winning right now. I don't know who's on the bum for them. I think it's 2-1. Someone said that in chat. Who cares, though? I'm not focused on the Yanks right now. I'm focused on my Mets. And what are the Mets doing? They are doing something historic here for us fans. And we got to appreciate it. Soak it in, guys, in August. And then when we get to September, which the Mets have their easiest schedule of the entire year on paper this September. Man, oh, man, it has to be feeling damn good to be a Mets fan because I know myself. I've been jumping for joy. I've been popping, you know, vessels in my throat by the times I've been yelling the past couple days off that huge high winning four or five against the Braves. Now I can calm down a bit and just enjoy a nice, fairly comfortable win here against the Cincinnati Reds where Chris Bassett did everything imaginable to get the Mets the dub today and the offense taking care of business per usual, guys. But let's talk now about we saw Chris Bassett. Let's get into the rest of the top five, right? Stolly Marte, big game for him, two for five with the home run, the two RBIs, the run scored in the stolen bag. Mets had two stolen bases on Justin Dunn today who basically was a stolen base printing entering tonight's start against these New York Mets. Tyler Naquin's my number three star. I originally had Vogie, and as I was doing the graphic, because as you guys probably know, naturally I'm setting up stuff, you know. I usually start to edit and get things prepped for the show around the bottom, the sixth, the top, the seventh inning. So I had Vogie originally as my number two star, but when Naquin comes out and just jaw drops me, what a beautiful near, just shy of a three-run bomb. He's got to be my number three star. Naquin taking care of business against his former club. One for three with the big triple and the two RBIs. Daniel Vogelback, it's, we're bringing sexy back. No, we're bringing Vogel back. Pateo Potato. He goes two for four with the double, the RBI, and he didn't have a run score because Canna ran for him, but that's fine. And Jeff McNeil continuing his now 11 game hit streak, one for three with a run scored. Mets just did what they had to do, a nice, comfortable win for them today. But guys, for everyone here in the live show, to my over 500 viewers, I'm going to start to get to your comments, questions, and concerns. But for people on replay, this is where I'm going to cut things off. So let me know in the comments below how do you feel about this Mets big win today, winning 5 1 over the Cincinnati Reds? Game one of a three-game set against these depleted Reds. Who was your biggest takeaway? For me, it has to be Chris Bassett. How can it not be? People in the live show, let me know in the chat right now. Who is your number one star from tonight's game? Was it Seabass or was it someone else? For people on replay, however, this is where I'll be cutting things off.